Let me take this opportunity to say that, that uh, I appreciate you watching us online or visiting us in service. It's also all, always a privilege. I had somebody to stop by this Wednesday night and say to me that they'd been watching us online and how that the Word of God had touched their hearts and that humbled me. And I pray that I can always preach the truth in love and love and, but also preach with conviction. So I, I appreciate you watching us. Uh, if you feel a desire and ever feel uh, like the Lord's speaking to you to give to our local church ministries, I encourage you to do that. You can do that by going to easytithe.com and finding Prospect Church of God there. And uh, you can do that. And I believe there's a QR code there that you can use there that take you directly into our, our giving website. We appreciate that. We are a small church with a big heart. And trying to do ministry is tough in the day we live. So I would encourage you to do that if at all possible. And uh, I'm not asking you to take tithe from your local church. Your tithe belongs to your local church, not ours. Uh, but maybe there's an offering that you would feel like giving to our church. And I would I'd really appreciate that. God bless you. Heavenly Father, we just give you glory and honor. Please move on our pastor, Brother Gan. Touch and heal him and strengthen him, O oh God. Heal him, God. Please, God. Move up on him, Lord God. Touch Sister Gan. Comfort her and minister to her. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Just move, I pray, God. Please move on, Brother Gan. Bring him up off that bed of affliction, God. Lord, he wants to be here doing what you called him to do, Lord God, to preach the gospel and to be the shepherd of this flock. Oh, hallelujah, God. Just move up on him. Touch Sister Gann today. I pray you'd have your way in this service today, that everything would be said for the glory and for the honor of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let everything be done for his honor, for his glory. Oh, we give you praise and honor. Praise and honor. Let's praise him for a few moments. We just praise you, God. We don't ask for anything. We just praise you. We glorify you. We honor you, God. We give you praise and glory and honor. Praise your holy name. Glory to your name, God. Glory to your wonderful name. We praise our Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. We just give him glory and honor. Praise his mighty name. Glory to his holy name. Praise your name, Jesus. Praise your mighty name. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Praise your name, God. Glory to your name. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your wonderful name. Praise your name forever, Jesus. We just give you glory and honor and praise. Praise your name. Uh, this morning we're going to do the offering like we usually do when we take our Israel offering up. Uh, we're going to take a love offering for our pastor. In addition to our regular tithing offering, we're going to take a love offering up for our pastor. I mean, he's in the hospital. You know, the bills, they don't stop just because he's in the hospital. His, his, their daily needs don't stop just because he's sick and, and in the hospital. And uh, we're going to receive our offering at this time. This uh, right here will go... For our, this will be a regular tithe and offering in this plate. In this plate, we will put our love offering for our pastor. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Patrick to pray a blessing over this offering today. This is our regular tithe and offering. This is uh, for Pastor Gay and love offering. Thank you for your giving and being faithful in your giving.
we come to the house to worship Praise the Lord, Lord this morning. Because we have a lot to be thankful for. And the same God that was at our revival last week is the same God that's here this morning. So let's give him our best praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord most high. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord most high. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are saved. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord most high. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord most high. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. The name of the Lord is strong tower the righteous run into it and they are saved praise the Lord praise the Lord let all Praise the Lord. Shake off those heavy bands. Lift up those holy hands. Let all God's people praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let all God's people praise the Lord. Shake off those heavy bands. Lift up those holy hands. Let all God's people praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let all God's people praise the Lord. Shake off those heavy bands. Lift up those holy hands. Let all God's people praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let all God's people praise the Lord. Shake off those heavy bands. Lift up those holy hands. Let all God's people praise the Lord. Praise Him. the morning praise him in the noon time praise him praise him praise him when the sun goes down love him love him love him in the morning love him in the new 
noontime love him love him love him when the sun goes down thank him thank him thank him in the morning thank him in the noontime thank him thank him thank him when the sun goes down serve him serve him serve him in the morning serve him in the noontime serve him serve So 
exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Majesty, worship His Majesty, Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Praise the Lord. We do worship His Majesty. He is worthy of praise, glory, and honor. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, let our children go to Children's Church at this time. Then we're going to go right into the Word when they're dismissed. Amen. How many of you are here to worship and praise the Lord today? Amen. Would you go ahead and give Him a hand clap of praise? Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for all that you do. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your hand upon our lives. We thank you, oh God, that we have victory today, no matter what it is that we're going through. Amen. You may be seated. I tell you what, I am excited to be here with you this morning. I got the phone call Friday night asking if I would be available to be with you, and part of me was glad to hear that. The other part of me was not so glad to hear that because in that conversation I, I heard that Brother Gann had been sick, and I tell you one thing, he is a wonderful, wonderful man of God, isn't he? And we're going to be praying for God's hand to be upon him. We're, hey, God is still in the healing business. Amen. And I do believe that God is touching him today. He has been with you all for, what, 17 years. Wow, that is rare these days. And uh, we love him, his, his wife, and, and what they mean to this community. And I tell you what, I feel a kindred spirit in this morning, this, today, this morning, and so it's an honor to be with you. A little bit about myself, I don't really like talking about myself, to be quite honest, but I am the Pastoral Care Spirit Care Director at Ministerial Care, and I've been there now since 2010, and most of my work now is in counseling. I do a lot of counseling. I, I counsel with other pastors, their, their, their spouse, and their kids. I've got quite a few teenagers that I'm counseling right now, and that's all over the country. Uh, most of my counseling is online, and so um, I've got counseling uh, from California to New York to four or five different, uh, different countries, and so I, I, I spend most of my time uh, listening more than I do speaking, and, but it is an honor to be here with you this morning. If you'd open your word, uh, the word today to 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 17. It's also good to have my daughter with us, Haley. And, uh, you know, as I said, uh, I was telling a few of you earlier, she has gotten her license on, uh, on Friday. And uh, let me hear you say, oh, me. And, uh, you know, this, uh, I have been praying a lot lately. Amen. And, uh, but no, she's a good driver. It's good to have her with me. Uh, my wife would have been with me, but she's highly involved with uh, the music there at the church that she goes into. And she's, she's singing this morning, so... Um, otherwise, she, she sends her, her greetings. If you want to, you can stand for the reading of the word today. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 17 to 24. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, what have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? And he said to her, Give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out loud to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times. 
and cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard. How many of y'all know it's good when the Lord hears? Amen. And the Lord heard in a voice, in the voice of Elijah, and the, the soul of the child came back to him, and he was revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. Praise God. Heavenly Father, I just ask right now that your hand be upon me. Lord, I humbly come before you right now and ask, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Just use me as a mouthpiece, O oh God. Let your spirit flow this morning. Allow us, O oh God, to be able to hear your word, O oh God, and let it touch and pierce our hearts, O oh God. No matter how long we've been in church, no longer how long we've been a child of yours, Father God, I ask right now that your hand be upon us and that you pierce our hearts today, Lord. And we ask it, O oh God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. You may be seated. This story here has always been really interesting to me because you have an energy crisis that really affects everyone at the time. You see, when you have a crisis like this, it doesn't just affect the poor, but it affects the rich as well. As usual, this impinges upon the poor first, however, and most decisively, our attention is focused on a nameless woman. We don't even know her name in the text, but God cares about those that are nameless as well. She had nothing, neither name. She didn't have food. She didn't have any hope whatsoever. And how many of y'all know how difficult it is to live through life without hope? I know. I don't know how people do it, quite frankly. I'm glad that whenever I'm feeling sad, when I feel like I need help, when I feel like I need something in my life, that I have someone that I can call upon. Amen. But she has no hope at this point in the story. She had nothing. She did have one thing, though, her son. Her beloved son, he was her only hope, her welfare system. Her link to life was through him. The story begins in the failed royal system with this nameless, forlorn widow. And Elijah enters into the story. He is another kind of character. He is, at this point, very young, perhaps uncredentialed. He's probably uncontaminated by the royal system or bought off. I'm sure he's not bought off at all. He's uncompromised by government plans for rain because they just keep on relying upon something that they can't rely upon. He is simply dispatched by Yahweh himself. An abrupt, unexplained command in verse 9, go to the widow. God cares about the widows. So Elijah does what a good man of God is going to do. He's going to go. He goes to meet the widow, and oddly he gives her an unending supply of food. See, Elijah is there to supply food. God does not tell Elijah anything other than that. I just want you to go supply food to this widow and to her son. And how many of you all know God doesn't always tell us everything? So oddly, he does this. He, he goes, and the plot now thickens as we pick up the story. Elijah did the wondrous miracle of food. I know the Word of God says, man shall not live by bread alone. Amen. But you also have to have bread. And as we see this story taking place, the boy, the, the widow's only hope in this age or in the age to come, in verse 17, she dies. I wonder if Elijah would have gone there if he would have known what was going to take place. Maybe he wouldn't have. I don't know. But nonetheless, Elijah follows the calling of Yahweh to go serve this widow with food. And while he's there, in verse 17, her son dies. And how many of y'all know when you're dealing with that kind of grief, and I think that's why I love this story, quite frankly, I deal with grief a lot. I deal with loss a lot. A lot of 
ministers who are feeling hurt, a lot of widows who have lost their spouse, a lot of young widows because of COVID. And a lot of times it's hard for us to make sense out of all of it. And there he is. He's now, the stakes are much higher than just food. This boy dies. She loses her son. She loses her grip on reality. She loses her cool. Not everything looks perfect. Not everything has the perfect words. Not everything has uh, everything that looks so wonderful. Sometimes in life it gets messy. And she loses her grip. And of course when this happens, the, the one thing that she links to this is the fact that Elijah is now here. And while Elijah is here, my son dies. So her natural conclusion is it must be Elijah's fault. And so she blames Elijah for his death. Verse 18, why have you come against me to cause the death of my son? I want you to see here she is frightened. Perhaps she is embarrassed that she trusted such an odd, young, uncredentialed man. She panics because she has lost her life support. The one thing that's probably keeping her going was her son, and he's no longer there. And now entered her own personal energy crisis. Probably she is a little guilty that she trusted the royal system. How many of you all know that there is no royal system or no government that's going to save us? Amen. I know that November 4th is coming up. It doesn't matter who wins the election on November 4th. God is still on the throne. Amen. We still are a people of hope, regardless of what happens in Washington. There is death here, though, and she blames Elijah. She drill, draws the conclusion that if you deal with this man, trouble is going to come. The death of the boy looms more severe than the drought, more severe than the hunger that's taking place. We watch to see what this odd individual is going to do. I mean, I know prophets in the Old Testament were a little weird. They were a little awkward, okay? And she's wondering, what is, what is up with this odd person? Nobody would expect a king to deal with death, as kings never claim power for such ultimate matters. Elijah, however, has hinted at much more than any king would ever undertake. Because Elijah, could Elijah now do what kings wouldn't dare do? He is abrupt. He is magisterial. And I want you to see he's not caught in the woman's terror. Now, one thing I love about Elijah in this story is because when the, when the woman starts to blame him, he doesn't get defensive. He doesn't look at her and say, what are you you're blaming me? I'm out of here. I didn't cause this. He didn't belittle her. He didn't make her feel less than. He didn't make her feel as though she was going insane. He listened. I don't know if Elijah knows a lot about grief up to this point, but I do believe that the Spirit was upon him. And he responded in a wonderful way. He says, give me your son. He takes the boy into his care and into the power of God Almighty. He gives the impression to the widow that he is prepared to take on even the reality of life and death. Something that no government will ever be able to do. And as we see this, he is prepared to do what kings dare not try to do, because they can't. And I want you to see, there's a lot of things Elijah could have done here. You don't have to have a system. You don't have to have an outline. You don't have to have a 10-point, you need to do this, 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 and this. Elijah does something really remarkable at this point when he's being accused of something that he didn't do. He's provided food. He's been there to help. He's been there to serve. He's following the Lord. While he's there, this woman in her deep grief, her son passes away, and she blames him. Elijah does something remarkable. He prays. He prays. He doesn't do anything else other than take the matter to the Lord. 
Now, I know sometimes it seems like it's not much whenever we say, I'm going to pray for someone. But how many of y'all know we really truly do pray? How many of y'all know that when we call upon the name of the Lord, He hears your prayer? He's right there listening to every word you say. And so he acts in a remarkable way. He prays. He turns the problem over and makes this a reality of God. He speaks to make death to be a concern for God. His words open the problem of death to the power and care of God. The woman is now not in the scene at all. There is only Elijah. He dominates the action up to this point in the text, if you look at it, and the drama, quite frankly. Elijah prays not once, but he prays twice. And as he prays, we see this individual. His prayer asserts that the reality of death is a larger issue than the woman ever suspects. The limits in life and the edges of life concern the reality, the power, the faithfulness of God. Elijah knew all of this. Elijah's first prayer, I want you to get this in verse 20. If you look in verse 20, his prayer is this. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodged by killing her son? That's pretty honest, isn't it? It's an accusation to the Lord. Did you cause this? I want you to know that God can handle your honest prayers. That there is no hurt that he wants you to have to shield yourself from him. He wants to hear it. Elijah is very honest here, and that first prayer is an accusation against God. Elijah knows that God deals in matters of life and death. Elijah asked God if God has caused this death, for Elijah knows that he himself, he knows this, he's not responsible. The woman tries to make him responsible, but Elijah knows that it's not his responsibility. He doesn't take that on himself. He knows that's not true. He knows that she's grieving, and in her grief, she's blaming him. And Elijah, in this story, after this accusation, there is, of course, no answer from God. God is not going to take such bait. He doesn't respond. And how many times, sometimes when we do pray, we don't hear a response. That doesn't mean that God's not hearing us. Elijah, at prayer, however, is determined. He's powerful. He's filled with authority. He prays again. This time, you want to talk about bold. He goes from accusing God to praying an imperative to God. Wow. Return the life of this child. God holds the power of life. How many of you all know that to be true? Some may have thought that the king was in charge. The king thinks he's in charge. The king wants everyone else to think they're in charge. But the reality of it is they're not in charge. Only the king of kings is in charge here. And kings do not figure into the world of Elijah here. Elijah has recast the human issue, and there is only death, God, and prayer. So God does something remarkable himself. He yields to Elijah. Elijah has compelled God to act, and in verse 22, Shema is the Hebrew word of that. Let me hear you say Shema. Say, I taught Hebrew today. Amen. Praise God. God heard. Are you thankful today that God hears? And God gives life back to the boy at the behest of Elijah. The boy lives in verse 22. The prayer, the faith, the carriage, the, the daring of Elijah has changed the world. How Elijah responded, how he reacted, it mattered. And God knew what was going to happen when God sent Elijah to the widow. Told him what he needed to hear 
And God knew that Elijah was the perfect person for that situation. And so Elijah takes the new birth boy back to the mother. I don't know if any of you have lost children or a child. But my parents, when I, I wasn't even born yet, I had a seven-year-old brother who was take, he went in for a, a, just a normal surgical procedure, an apodectomy, I think, and had an allergic reaction to the anesthesia. Lack of oxygen got to his brain, and he was on life support for 30 days. And even though I wasn't there to witness it, I wasn't born yet, I still felt the weight of that death throughout my childhood. That's hard to do. That's hard to deal with. And when you look at that kind of grief, that kind of pain, you can kind of understand a little bit about this woman, this mother, her pain, her hurt. This isn't pretty. This isn't something that looks good. I'm sure she's weeping and she's crying and she, she, has none, she, she doesn't have the theological words to say. She doesn't know what to pray. She just knows that she's hurting. She just knows that she's lost all hope at this point. She's frantic. She's confused. She's upset. Elijah says simply to her. Now imagine going from that kind of grief to here's your son, your son I wonder, I just wonder if she just did a little gig right there, just a little dance. Because I doubt very seriously that's something that she didn't express, some type of emotional response. I'm sure there was praise coming from her lips. There was once death in the situation, and God brought it back to life. There are some things in our lives that we don't need to have. However, there are some things that have been dormant, that have been dead for way too long, that needs to be brought back to life. And this woman... This widow, praise God, the boy lives. The prayer, the faith, the daring, all of that, it changed the world. Elijah takes the new birth boy back to the mother, and she simply says, your son lives. Now, I want you to see this. Elijah does not celebrate himself. He doesn't say, look what I did. He doesn't say, Look at the power that I have. Or if I wouldn't have done this, this would No. Elijah does not take the credit. Because he knows the one who has given life back to the boy of this son. Let us never forget, Lord. Let us never forget, church. He who holds the power does not rely upon us. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. For it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Elijah does not celebrate himself. He does not even mention God nor bear witness to God. That's interesting to me. He only describes the new reality wrought out of intense, demanding faith. The woman is as changed as the boy. And you can't have much more change than from death to life. But the woman is... Is changed. How many of y'all know when God does a work in someone's life close to us that we love, it doesn't just change that person, it changes you as well. It's a communal kind of thing. And the woman has changed. The last time she had spoken in the story, she had accused of Elijah in verse 18. She goes from accusation to celebration, Elijah without reservation. I know you are a man of God. The word of God is in your mouth, verse 24. The woman knows that where new life comes, the unexpected power of God is visible. She celebrates Elijah, but she confesses much more. I know God has not quit. She went from absolute disdain, hurt, pain, hopelessness, to joy, filled with a great sense of life, vigor, passion, hope once again. That is what God does to us in our lives. 
That's the kind of God that we serve. We don't serve a God that's six feet under. We serve a God that is still doing a work in our lives. He's not a deist. He's not just sitting back and just letting us play out our lives. Oh, no. God is involved in each and every one of your lives. He cares about each and every one of us today. Amen. And she says, I know the power for life is at work. I know the rule of God is not contained to the pitiful little regime of the government. I know that power does not lie in the dysfunction of the king. Rule of God is not contained in that. Indeed, the king is completely absent from the drama. He doesn't even, ma- it doesn't even matter at this point. It doesn't even matter. I'll vote. I'll do what I need to do as a citizen of the United States of America. But I'm not going to fray, freight over it. I'm not going to panic. Because I know either way, God already knows the outcome. He is still in control. And the reality is, as we kind of come towards the ending of this story, why would anyone call on Elijah? He can do nothing. Life is broken loose. The king cannot, not Elijah, but the king. The king cannot exact life. The king cannot block life from coming. My son was dead and is alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God has done what kings cannot do. And the story is really about Elijah's oddness in some ways. It it shows that the powerful life, the power is not explained, is only witnessed to. We don't understand a lot of what really transpires about how this happens or why this happens or or anything like that. It reminds me of the story uh, also in Kings where the king comes and he's wanting to be healed. And he he comes with a whole, just kind of his own, you know, posse, if you will, right? Uh, Because he's a king. He wants to be seen. And the prophet says, go wash seven times. And the king complains because it's not the kind of healing he thought he deserved. It doesn't matter. The result was still the same. God is going to do things his way. And as we see this story, the routine, the, 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 what really takes place, And we look at this, how is life possible among us in our massive resistant defeats? How is life possible when we have to go through so much? The text gives us a cue, but no explanation. Earlier in this same chapter, Elijah is cautioned, called, I want you to get this, and commissioned by Yahweh. He's called in the midst of the drought to deal with this energy crisis in verse 1 of this chapter. Now, don't, don't miss this. Elijah is sent by God to drink from the brook and to eat the food given to him by ravens in verse 4. I wonder how often Elijah thought to himself, Lord, why am I here? Why is it that everyone else is eating at the king's table? Why is it that everyone else has a seat at the table? And you have me out here eating scraps from ravens that doesn't taste good, that's just giving him just enough, I'm sure, just to survive. Why am I going through this? And I'm sure at that time it made absolutely no sense to Elijah whatsoever. And how many times you know that sometimes when we feel like God is punishing us, the reality of it is he's not punishing us. He's preparing us. And the food that I'm sure is offered is not tasty. It tastes like the drivel of birds, for crying out loud. It's, it's not very reliable food. He's relying upon nature at that point. He's really relying upon God to provide that. It turned out, nonetheless, to be adequate food. Morning, evening, bread, and meat. The birds kept the airlift going. Elijah had water and just enough to make it, as verse 6 tells us. Such tenuous power supply. But God gives him enough. His food supply lies outside the administration of the king. Elijah, I don't want you to get the same food, the same provision that the king provides. Because at the end of the day, the king's not going to give you what you need to have. 
We talk about power. We talk about Pentecost and seeing God do a move in our lives. We celebrate it, and I think we should. God is still doing a work. I'm glad to be Pentecostal. Let me hear you say amen. But how many of you all know you can't skip verse 1 and verse 2 and verse 3 to get to verse 20? Are you willing to go through what God has called you to go through? That's not going to look glamorous. It's not going to look great. And it's certainly not going to taste good. But how many of y'all know that God has a plan? And Elijah going through this, we see this take place. We start to realize that the miracle of bringing from death to life doesn't rely upon royal junk food, but it relies upon the food that God provides. Amen. How many of y'all know that what we do in our lives, seeing miracles take place, it's hard to do that when we're eating off the royal junk food. What are we intaking in our lives? Amen. He does not obey the king. He does not participate in the energy crisis. Understand, he does not fight the king either. He doesn't try to go to war with the king because he doesn't have to. Amen. He simply proceeds with the assurance that the king is fundamentally irrelevant to the basic human issue of food, health, justice, and life. And as we see this story come to a closure here, two things come clear in this story to me. Elijah's power from God comes from his eating habits. That was not a coincidence. God did not have Elijah do that for no reason. He always has a reason. Amen. And sometimes I think as we look at this story, maybe we need to think about a different kind of diet. What are we ingesting in our lives? Are we spending more time on Facebook than we are in the book? Are we, are we more interested in what CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News is saying rather than what God's Word is saying? Do we spend most of our time on all the other things that are all the other things that's being thrown at us than we do in God's Word. It's right here. Amen. It is right here. And as I close, I'm compelled to think that it's time for us to think of another power, another diet, another way of living. Those who do not know the Lord don't want the same thing that they've been fed over and over and over again. They need something different. They need the power and the working of the Holy Ghost. They need God doing a miraculous work in their lives. They need us to not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This isn't old-fashioned. This isn't old school. His word does not get old. This is the exact thing that those of us in our lives, they need it more than ever. And I'm trying to think of how to close this up, and I can't think of any better way. If you would stand with me right now. My heart, my prayers are with this church. Because you have a wonderful pastor. Amen. And I still believe that God can do a work of healing upon him. And at this moment, I know what he's thinking. He would rather... There's no place he'd rather be right now than right here. Talk to too many pastors, too many spouses, and I know your pastor, and he loves you so much. 
And so we're going to pray for him today. And I want our assistant, Pastor, if you would, would you be willing to stand in for him this morning? Amen. Do we have any anointing oil? Right here it is, right here. Church, would you come to this altar if you can? If not, right where you're at, lay your hands upon us. But if you could, come on out here. And let's lift up Pastor Gann to you, to, to the Lord today. And if you're here this morning, after I say that prayer, if you're here this morning and you need a touch from the Lord, you need healing, you have someone in your life that needs the Lord, we're going to pray for you. Amen. Because there's nothing that I can say that's going to be more important than what we do at this altar. I appreciate you. I appreciate what God is doing through you and in you. How long have you been here now? I've been here almost 10 years. 10 years. I know Pastor Gann loves you, respects you. And he, here's a big thing right here. He trusts you. Amen. We're going to ask the Lord to touch him today, Pastor Gann. Amen. Hallelujah. Would you lay your hands on? Heavenly Father, we come before you right now. Lord God, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Holy Spirit, we rely upon you, O oh God. We ask, O oh God, that you touch him, O oh God, O oh Lord. Allow him, O oh God, take away his pain, O oh God, his hurt, O oh God. Touch his wife, O oh Lord, and ask, O oh God, that you, your hand will be upon both of them. Father, we've seen miracle after miracle happen over the last 17 years, oh God. We ask one more time, oh God. Touch him today, oh God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory to God. I don't want this moment to pass. We still have 15 minutes till noon, amen. If you're here today and you need a word, a prayer of healing, someone in your life that needs the Lord that you want to stand in for, this is your chance. I don't want to miss this opportunity. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, don't worry about what people are thinking. You know, we are the community of faith, right? You know why we rely upon the Holy Spirit and God to help us? Because we can't do it ourselves. And when He built the church, He did it because He knows that we need each other. I need wisdom from those who have gone before me. I need those who have a willing heart for the Lord to work in their lives. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. See, this is, I went and got my doctorate degree in 2014. But I can't think of a greater title than brother. Brother. Brother Tim, because we're the family of God. Haley, you're my daughter, so the way you don't you don't call me brother, you call me dad. Amen. We love you. And I just want one last time, if you're here today and you want prayer for anything, this is your chance. Amen. 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 Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me today and lift your hands towards and on this wonderful woman of faith. 
Hallelujah. Lord, we ask right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we ask, oh God. Praise the Lord. Anyone else? Hallelujah. I'm going to turn the service over to your associate pastor. But before I do that, we're, would you sing us a song to close us out? Is that okay? Anything you got, sister. She got such a beautiful voice. I got to hear it one more time. Amen. As she's singing, would you just enter into his gates with thanksgiving and love in your heart? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just worship him as Jessica sings. Pray, God, as we leave, that you'll bless each and every one. Draw each and every one of us nearer and closer to you. Keep your hand upon everyone. Protect everyone, Lord God. Just draw them closer to you, God. Lord, we thank you for everything that you have done today, that you, what you've done here in this service. We praise you and glorify you and lift you up. Oh, hallelujah. We just give you glory and honor. Praise your mighty name. Hallelujah. Lord, be with each and every one. Lord, if be your will, bring us back again tonight at 6 o'clock. Just give you praise and honor and glory. Oh, hallelujah. Praise your name. We ask in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Amen and amen.